Sahara Desert, one of the harshest climates in the world. A huge expanse of unforgiving rock, scrub and sand the size of Europe. To me, it looks like a place of nothingness. But it was from here that a group of desert nomads came to transform the northwest corner of Africa into a vast empire that stretched from the Sahara to Spain. What started with one man's mission grew into a kingdom which lasted for centuries. Its rulers generated tremendous wealth, created great architecture and promoted sophisticated ideas in an ordered society. They were called the Berber, and they changed this part of Africa forever. We know less about Africa's past than almost anywhere else on Earth. But the scarcity of written records doesn't mean Africa lacks history. It's found in artifacts, culture, and the traditions of the people. In this series, I'm exploring some of the richest and most vibrant histories in the world. I'm here in Morocco to explore how a small collection of Berber nomads created a vast kingdom out of nothing, and how the very forces that created that kingdom ultimately helped to destroy it. Twenty-first century Morocco, a modern Islamic state whose Arab king claims descent from the Prophet Muhammad. He rules over a country with a culture and a history as diverse as its landscape. Morocco has coasts that face the Atlantic and the Mediterranean Sea, snow-covered mountains almost as high as the Alps, and the bone-dry fringes of the Sahara Desert. The dominant languages spoken here now are from Arabia and Europe. But nearly half the population still speak Berber, the language of the indigenous Africans. A thousand years ago, this was their land, but there was no sense of a nation state. Instead, on either side of the Atlas Mountains live small, independent Berber clans of farmers, traders and nomads. These people were Muslim. But they maintained their traditional Berber customs. And they didn't always follow Islam to the letter of the law. But in the mid-11th century, one man changed everything. A Berber who'd studied the Quran and had become a charismatic, fiery preacher. Idealistic and uncompromising, he had a clear mission to change his fellow Berbers into proper Muslims, schooled in the strict fundamentals of their religion. His name was Abdullah ibn Yasin, and his travels to Islamic centers of learning had left him a student of a strict legalistic interpretation of the Quran. He started his mission in the Western Sahara, where he pulled together an alliance of tribes and appointed himself a spiritual leader. In so doing, he started a series of events that completely transformed Northwest Africa. In the year 1054, he led an army of thousands of nomads and headed for Sigil Massa then a major trading post on the edge of the Sahara and one of the most important cities in Africa. Ibn Yasin and his followers were called al Muravids, from a phrase meaning those bound together in the cause of God. They were determined to bind everyone to the cause. They had one simple mission, 
jihad. The term jihad today carries connotations for many people of anti-Western extremism. But Ibn Yasin's holy war, his struggle to uphold a true understanding of Islam, was aimed at his fellow Muslim Berbers. This spectacular ruin is now all that's left of Sijil Masa, a city of well over 50,000 people, built in the middle of one of the biggest oases in Africa. Now a quiet and tranquil backwater, the date palms and irrigated fields hide clues to a much bigger and more significant past. And it's on a shingle bank, at the heart of the oasis, where the ruins of the mud-built city lie. The taking of Sigil Masa would be the first major building block of an Almoravid kingdom. So what attracted Ibn Yashin here? The wealth of the city. This yeah. city was very prosperous. In fact, it was the commercial hub of Morocco, a huge city in a huge oasis. Dr. Eric Ross has been involved in some of the recent archaeological studies here that have confirmed why this was such an important prize for Ibn Yasin. I call it the Casablanca of a thousand years ago. Yes. Because uh, Morocco wasn't looking to Europe or the Atlantic. It was looking across the Sahara. The Sahara was uh, wide open to trade. So there were goods coming from all over the region and they were being traded and exchanged here. Yes. And what sorts of things are being traded here? Cloth, uh, manuscripts and books, horses also. The most important was uh, the gold, trading mostly south across the Sahara. Places uh, like Mali and Senegal today were producing especially gold. So gold was the main part of the wealth of the city. We know gold coins were minted here, they were stamped here, and they were exported. And mostly they were exported uh, eastward to Egypt, uh, Iraq, Central Asia, and they ended up in places like India. Wow. So they're trading tendrils, they'd stretch all the way from West Africa as far as South Asia. Yes, absolutely. It's a trading powerhouse. Yes, it is. And the envy of empires across the continent, they all tried to take it, and uh, the Almoravid succeeded in doing that. Once they had Sijil Masa under their control, the Almoravids set about securing the source of the city's gold trade. They crossed a thousand miles back to the opposite side of the Sahara and seized the trading town of Odakhost. By controlling the supply of gold across the desert, they had a virtual monopoly on this, the most lucrative of trades. With a considerably strengthened army of weapons and camels taken from Sijil Masa, the Almoravids now had what they needed to carry their jihad beyond the Sahara. But they couldn't have done any of this without another important resource, the key to life itself. Water sustains everything in this harsh climate, and the Berbers had the know-how to find and to move it under the desert. These are Katara. They're part of an ancient Berber irrigation system. And you see these mounds stretching out across this landscape. What do you see on the surface belies a very complex network of tunnels that sit underneath the ground, funneling the water across this landscape. Because water was such a rare resource. These access shafts are all that you see of the gently sloping tunnel system that taps into the underground water table. These systems could take water for miles in this very arid, dry, hot landscape and to take it where it was needed. And it just says how the Berber understood this landscape, how they worked with it, how they used the small resources that they had to their advantage. With a powerful army, money and the rallying call of Islam, Ibn Yasin now had the potential to create a Berber nation. 
the Almoravids Jihad had an unstoppable momentum, but now they wanted to take their brand of Islam to every Berber. And that meant crossing the Atlas Mountains. The high Atlas Mountains rise to over 13 and a half thousand feet. And they form a natural divide between the desert and the more fertile and populous lands on the other side. But these were dangerous times, and this was a perilous area to be traveling through. A thousand years ago, these valleys would have carried one of the main trade routes through the mountains, and that made it attractive to thieves. Ibn Yasin and his men were in bandit country. This is called the Road of a Thousand Kasbahs. And Kasbahs are these fortified houses that were once owned and used by Berber merchants. These buildings would have often been used to house things like gold and silks that came across the desert. And they had to be fortified because this was a dangerous territory. These are beautiful buildings, but their fortifications give a sense of what it was like in those days. The Almoravid army traversed this hostile environment with 400 horsemen, 800 cameleers, and 2,000 foot soldiers. It was a treacherous journey in an alien landscape. A thousand years ago, when Ibn Yasin and his army came up these passes to cross these mountains, they were entering completely new territory. They were desert warriors, and these mountains and everything beyond was a completely different environment to them. but they had a clear goal. To the northwest of the mountains lived the tribes of Berbers that the Almoravids considered to be heretics. In 1058, the first people to feel the force of Ibn Yasin's army were the rulers of Agmat, a small city nestling in a lush valley on the north side of the mountains. Agmat became the new headquarters from where the army took their jihad to the tribes nearby. But it's been difficult for historians to uncover what life was like in Agmat at the time, for one simple reason. No one knew where ancient Agmat was. It was thought to be a lost city, but actually it was right here beneath our feet. The dig has revealed only a small portion of the city so far, but this hammam, or bathhouse, is one of the most substantial and important finds. These remains illustrate the scale of the settlement here and show just how expertly they understood how to use water as a foundation of civic society. L'eau est une richesse très importante dans la région. Abdullah Fili has been slowly unearthing the remains of the buildings here since the dig first started. Au-delà de, 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 de l'utilisation de l'eau dans les bâtiments publics comme le hammam, la mosquée, le palais, etc., nous avons également l'utilisation d'eau dans l'irrigation. Euh, on répartit l'eau selon deux composantes. La première composante, c'est les bâtiments publics et les bâtiments privés, les maisons, etc. Et puis après les trois jours, les trois autres jours, c'est pour l'irrigation des champs. Remarkably, this entire building, which dates from the time of the Almoravids, more than a thousand years ago, was excavated almost intact. Effectivement, on trouve que c'est l'un des plus anciens hammams au Maroc. It's gorgeous. Après celui, il représente donc l'un des plus grands hammams de l'Occident musulman, et ça permet effectivement d'avoir un chef-d'œuvre architectural extrêmement important. C'est énorme comme euh, euh, hammam 
Il fait pour le moment 500 mètres carrés, ce qui est exceptionnel pour un hammam parce que ça demande justement une ingéniosité au niveau des techniques de chauffage, au niveau des techniques de l'alimentation la, de en eau. This is absolutely amazing. I'm used to seeing their earth-built buildings, but to see this kind of stone and mortar construction, but also the water engineering, this is real innovation. It's so exciting. There was hot and cold running water. The temperature of the three rooms increased the nearer they were to the huge fires that heated the water as it came into the hammam. This civilized living. C'est pour ça que la question de l'eau est vraiment centrale pour pour le, le fonctionnement d'un bâtiment aussi important car il permet euh, la purification des gens. Les gens viennent ici se purifier par exemple une fois par semaine, une fois toutes les deux semaines, etc. pour pour se reposer parce que le hammam avec le système de, de, de chaleur ça permet de reposer les corps et aussi parfois les esprits. These were people who came from the desert for whom water was a precious resource. This is more than a bathhouse. This is a temple to water and water place. The Amoravids were beginning to appreciate city life, but there was a problem. For desert nomads, this city was just in the wrong place. Surrounded by mountains and hills on three sides, Agmat was not in a good defensive position. As people most suited to fighting in the open, it made them feel vulnerable. After a little more than a decade, the Almoravids looked for a new home, a new base from where they could expand and take on even more territory and infidels. The Almoravids had the desert in their DNA. And they chose a flat, dry, open piece of land around 20 miles from the foothills of the Atlas Mountains. They pitched their tents and named their city after the Berber words, the land of God. It was called Marrakesh. The founding of Marrakesh in 1070 represents a point when a loose band of marauding jihadists become an imperial force to be reckoned with. What began as a collection of tents rapidly became an established city. The Berbers who settled here were offered security in return for their taxes, and that paid for the further expansion of the Almoravid's territory. The movement seemed unstoppable. Even when Ibn Yassin died, while fighting Berber heretics, the holy enterprise continued unabated. After the death of the fiery preacher Ibn Yassin, a new man took charge of the jihad. His name was Yusuf Ibn Tashvin, and he made a greater contribution to the dynasty than any other man. He turned a fledgling kingdom into an empire. While Ibn Yassin had been the spiritual leader who'd inspired the Almoravid movement and led it out of the desert, Ibn Tashvin would take the dynasty even further. It began with Marrakesh. Katara were dug to supply water to the growing population, and walls were built to surround it. The street that we are, yes. it was made at this time, this and especially the walls we will see the walls were made at this time. Former Minister of Education, Professor Mohammed Khanidri, knows Ibn Tashfin's city well. What sort of man was Ibn Tashfin? What was he like? Yes, Ibn Tashfin was uh, a very high man, very courageous, and a beautiful, handsome man. Beautiful, handsome. Handsome, handsome yes, handsome. And, uh, and he was uh, especially very courteous and very, very strong man. 
very strong man and has a big personality. And how, how did he change Marrakesh? He said that here we'll have a palace, here we'll have a commerce, here we'll have an administration. And he made a very good plan and he began to, to make construction of that, to realize. Really? Yes, yes. So he built these streets? And yeah, the... the street was made at this time. Yeah. Just like as you see it now, with the commerce and with the with the, the sellers, uh, the seller of everything, vegetables and uh, also spices and with colors, smells and uh, many smells, many colors. It was like that uh, since uh, since long time, since the 11th century. So wandering around here, you still get a flavor of the days of Ibn Tashfin? Yes, of course, yeah. The walls that Ibn Tashfin commissioned have been rebuilt many times. But one of his original gates, the Bab Dukala, still stands. It's huge, but it's remarkably simple. Yes. The architecture of Al Murabid is very simple. The, the Al Murabid was uh, came from the Sahara, and they were Muslims, and they have the philosophy of Islam, which is that you have harmony, you have beauty, but simplicity. I love that the idea of harmony, of beauty of simplicity, all of those things together in this gate. And every time you pass through here, you're going to remember that. And for those people that felt part of this community, they were tied together by that simple, beautiful philosophy. And uh, I think it's a, it's a philosophy of life. But it's something which begins here. That's right. The Amoravids had created a worthy capital. Now they set about establishing an empire. Their army took the jihad north, taking city after city, expanding their influence east as far as Algiers, well beyond what we now call Morocco. Back in Marrakesh, the Amoravid reflected on their extraordinary achievements. It had taken 26 years from their first incursion out of the desert with the taking of Sidra Masa to the point where they controlled the whole of Northwest Africa. Their next move extended the Almoravid's jihad beyond anyone's expectations, north into Europe. A parallel Islamic world had existed in Spain and Portugal since the early 8th century. It was called Al-Andalus, and it had flourished under the Caliph of Cordoba into a rich civilization of lavish palaces and elegant gardens. Now in the 11th century, it had broken up into weaker city-states. These were being attacked by Christian armies from the north of Spain, and the Muslim rulers appealed to the Almoravids for help. Yusuf ibn Tashfin helped repel the Christians, but he was disgusted at the decadence of the Muslim princes he'd agreed to help. Ibn Tashfin had enough of these party princes and their moaning. He also disliked their lack of dedication to Islam. But he decided he had an obligation to save the souls of their Muslim subjects. And in 1090, he returned in force and deposed their rulers one by one. The Almoravids now ruled over a vast kingdom that reached from the Sahara to Spain and from Africa's Atlantic coast to Algeria. Never before had all this Muslim territory been united under one management. One kingdom united politically and spiritually. And it was the so-called barbarians of the desert that had done it. The beating heart of the kingdom was Marrakesh. This was a place where people came to exchange stories, ideas. Stories that had been traded across the desert from as far away as West Africa. Stories that had come from Southern Europe, from the Middle East. But they all ended up here, here in the central square in Marrakesh. By the beginning of the 12th century, the square here had become the news hub of the empire. 
But in 1106, the news running around this square was of terrible importance. Yusuf ibn Tashvin had died. Ibn Tashvin was more than 80 years old when he died. He had seen his Berber kingdom grow from the founding days of Marrakesh to the farthest reaches of his empire. But now, the warrior king was dead, and the mantle of ruler of the Almoravids dynasty passed to Ibn Tashfin's 23-year-old son, and a very different era began. One of power and privilege. Ali was the first Almoravid leader not to have known the desert or its hardships. He knew the royal palace and its luxuries. At the time of his father's death, the royal treasury housed 13,000 boxes of silver and 5,400 boxes of minted gold. He was loaded. The new leader worked hard to make Marrakesh even more splendid, and he ordered a new palace to be built. It was part of a beautification plan for the city which drew heavily on the architectural influences of Andalusia. It was thought that no buildings were left that could show us what Ali's grand vision might have looked like. Then, in 1952, buried under some outbuildings, they found this. It's not only a rare example of Almoravid architecture, but it gives us some sense of what this city looked like at the high point of the dynasty. This is the Copa. This is the masterpiece of the architecture of the Almoravid oh, period. It is a masterpiece. Yes. Professor Mohammed Al Faiz has written extensively on the buildings of Marrakesh. And I think that the architects came in from Andalusian uh, Spain. They make this, this jewelry, this, this very, very beautiful. It's unique in, in the architecture of Morocco. Look at this simplicity of lines yes. and harmony of proportions. It is absolutely yes, gorgeous. It's, 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 so this was a place where people before prayer would come yes, and they would wash, yeah. they would wash their, their bodies. They, they wash their bodies and they, they prepare when they go to the mosque. It's a sumptuous building. It tells us just what Marrakesh may have looked like. It must have been a place with fantastic architecture and also very, very wealthy people who yeah. were obviously living yes. the, high, the high life. It's a, a very rich civilization because Marrakesh was a, a capital of empire. Mm -hmm. Uh, like actually when we have uh, New York or other cities, uh, very important. This delicately carved interior is such a contrast to the bold, simple shape we see outside. It was also highly fashionable. These wonderful scallop shell shapes were common in Andalusia. And this is the first time that they've been seen in Africa. Ali wanted nothing but the best. What was Ali bin Yusuf like? He's different from his father. He was a liberal man. I think that the reign of uh, Ali bin Yusuf is very important because with him, we have uh, the development of uh, architecture, of uh, cultural uh, uh, humanities, uh, poets, uh, and uh, it is... Uh, it's not the same, uh, the same uh, character of uh, his uh, father. This is a massive architectural statement in the palace grounds, which shows just how far the Almoravids had come since their days as desert warriors bent on holy war. But while Ali beautified the Almoravid capital, the kingdom was starting to slip from his grasp. Ali's 
under Ali, the link to the desert tradition was broken, and to some, the Almoravids seemed to be going soft. High in the mountains behind the city, a force even more powerful than the Almoravids was stirring. The fires of dissent were being stoked by rival Berbers holed up in the high Atlas Mountains. This precarious mountain track leads to what was, in effect, their mountain hideout. The Almoravids were never comfortable in the hills and mountains of the high Atlas. And whenever they tried to root out trouble, they were evaded. And there was plenty of trouble brewing. Here, a new group of Islamic revolutionaries laid the groundwork for their domination of this whole region. They were called the Almohads meaning the people who believed in the unity of God. The leader of the revolution was Muhammad ibn Tumut. He wasn't a desert warrior like the Amoravids. He was a mountain Berber. Ibn Tumut had spent decades studying Islam. He claimed to have been divinely chosen to restore the true faith as he understood it. This is Tin Mel, the village where Ibn Tumat started his revolution. From here, he preached against the arrogance and corruption of the Almoravids. Professor Muhammad Rabatatuddin has studied the power struggle that developed between the Almoravids and their fiercest critic. La société marocaine à cette époque-là était une société purement musulmane. Ibn Tumrt, le rôle, le rôle d'Ibn Tumrt n'est pas faire l'islamisation ou faire, la, faut, elle, faire une deuxième fois de, 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 de l'islamisation de, la de la société. Non. Ce qui a fait, c'est une politisation de la religion pour faire ou pour donner une légitimité à son projet politique. So your interpretation is that the religious manipulation of the text was something that Ibn Tumat was, was spearheading as a way of changing regimes. Cet objectif, dans lui aussi, dans lui aussi, la création de la grande empire islamique dans la Méditerranée occidentale, qui est la dynastie ou l'empire Al mm -hmm. So Ibn Tumat wants to increase his political influence and then go down the mountain to attack Marrakesh. Tinmel est la base et le point de départ vers Marrakesh. Ibn Tumat undermines support for the Almoravids by questioning their interpretation of Islam and therefore their claim to legitimate rule. And he goaded Ali bin Yusuf into combat. In 1130, the Battle of Words finally turned to war, and the army of the Almohads came out of the mountains to face the Almoravids and lay siege to their cities. It would be a long campaign. In Marrakesh, the city walls were reinforced and rebuilt by the Amravids in direct response to the Almohad threat. A culture based on nomadic traditions and tents turned in its most desperate moment to huge walls like this to protect themselves. But their ancient belief that walls imprisoned rather than protected proved true as they became increasingly confined to the city. It took almost 20 years of skirmishing battles for the Almohads to finally enter the city of Marrakesh. And in 1147, the dynasty of the Almoravids was finally over. Once inside the city walls, the Almohads wanted to stamp their authority on the city, and they started by replacing the most significant of the Almoravids' buildings. 
This is the Ketubia Mosque, named after the Al Ketubian, or the booksellers who used to ply their trade here. It's also Marrakesh's most important building. Legend has it that the predecessor to this mosque was torn down by the Almohads because it wasn't correctly aligned with Mecca. In fact, all the mosques in the city were pulled down and replaced on religious grounds. This sent a big, bold message to the people of Marrakesh. They were making it clear that their way and their interpretation of Islam was the correct one. And anyone arriving in the city got a similar message. This is the Bab Agnu, or the Gate of Guinea. It was built by one of Ibn Tumar's successors, Sultan Yaqub el Mansur, in 1185. It's a beautiful gate, this one. So ornate. This is an Al Mohad gate. And it's so different. Earlier, I just did a quick sketch of the Almoravid Gate. And the Almoravid Gate is just one of those perfect, very, very simple gates. But this one, so different from the Almoravids and that modesty. It's so much more sumptuous, layers upon layers of decoration that have been built up with this Beautiful green stone. This is an empire, a kingdom, and is very, very pleased to announce it to everyone who enters the city. Almost everything the Almo had built seemed more substantial, more impressive than that built by their predecessors. And that included the Berber kingdom. Just like the rulers before them, the Almohad used Marrakesh as an imperial base for an expansion even more ambitious than their predecessors. The Almohads took over almost all the territory previously run by the Almoravids, and they also seized the neighboring lands of Africa, which stretched into what is now Libya. In Spain, they took Andalusia and made Seville their second capital after Marrakesh. Under the Almohads, the kingdom was to become an even stronger force in the Mediterranean than the Almoravids had been. And their wealth and ideas went hand in hand. Here in the Bank of Maghreb is evidence to show how both dynasties used their currency to spread the word of Islam. This is a gold dinar. Yeah, it's from Sijil Masa, oh, yes. Almoravid dynasty. I see. That's beautiful. With an Arabic, an Arabic in, inscription, inscription right yeah. in the center. What does it say on there? Woman Yabtari, Gayra al Islami Dinan, Felan Yukbala Minhu, Wahu Fil Akhirati, Minal Khasiri. It shall not be acceptable that anyone takes a faith other than Islam. That's in the center of the coin. So they're actually helping to evangelize. Those coins will uh, circulate it of a lot of Medi Medi Mediterranean Sea. We have it in Spain, in Portugal, in London, in Germany and Holland and uh, China. Really? Yeah. This was the dollar of its, yeah. of its day. Yeah, yeah. It's about trade, but it's also taking wherever it goes, religion. Because uh, a lot of uh, Christian, Christian kingdom used these coins at this time. It's a beautiful thing, absolutely beautiful. The Almoravids' dinar was widely valued. The Almohads wanted to build on its success, but they also wanted to do things differently. They introduced innovations, including a new coin with a square design that proclaimed the ambition of their jihad. So this one, is the first round dirham uh, minted by al -Muhad. It's round, but with a square in the middle. But after this one, so here. Well, okay. Now that's square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's square. So 
they created these circular coins first with the square inscription in the center. And then they reduced them down just to these squares. Technically, uh, in the mint of coins, it's easy to do something with the coins which is uh, square. So these squares were much more efficient mm -hmm. to be minted because there was much less wasted from a square sheet of, 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 of silver. Mm. That's correct. And it's amazing that that's just a tiny thin wafer of silver and yet it represents so much. These four sides mm -hmm. were seen as being symbolic of the four sides of the kingdom. Yeah. of the different directions, directions. looking eastward, yeah. eastward towards um, India, towards mm -hmm. um, China, looking north mm -hmm. up toward Europe, looking south towards the, the, the desert and west towards new opportunities. Mm -hmm. But this is about an empire expanding. Yeah. Under the Almohads, the Berber kingdom had become extraordinarily powerful and wealthy. They undertook increasingly ambitious projects to reflect the magnificence of their empire. These are the Agdal Gardens in the grounds of the royal palace in Marrakesh. Almost a thousand acres of orange, lemon, fig, apricot and pomegranate trees, linked by olive-lined walkways, all irrigated by water brought from the mountains over 20 miles away. And I think they're beautiful. This is the Almohad using water in such a luxuriant way. I mean, this setting was meant to be a place in which you could come and reflect on this landscape. And what they're using are all the traditional constituent parts of Berber culture. You have here water, you have the palms, you have olives, you have fruit trees. These are things that they would have had in their oases. But what they're using them for here is for recreation and just simply for people to come and reflect on the beauty of Berber culture. And even today, hundreds of years on, who can doubt that they succeeded? At the end of the 14th century, the Muslim philosopher Ibn Khaldun wrote about the Berber state being just like a garden. Within this garden, the government turned like a wheel. He said that there was no justice without the monarch, no monarch without the army, no army without taxes, no taxes without wealth, and no wealth without justice. Ibn Khaldun's vision of a garden in perfect balance highlighted just how interdependent these elements of government were. Justice was defined by the monarch, who was supported by the army. They were paid for by taxes that were generated by the wealth of its citizens. While all of those things were in place and intimately connected, the wheel could continue to turn. And 240 miles north of Marrakesh is a city that shows how well the system worked while it remained in perfect balance. Its Medina is probably the most complete medieval city centre in the world, a place that has changed little since the days of the Almohads. This is Fez, one of the great cities of the empire. Then, as now, 
a great centre of trade. From here, the Almohad traded in things like sugarcane and cotton, like gold and copper and pottery. But some of the most significant things they dealt in were ideas. In spite of their religious views, the Almohad were not intellectually repressive. The ancient University of Fez attracted thinkers and scholars from right across the Mediterranean. Deep in the centre of the old Medina is a theological college. It welcomed hundreds of scholars through its doors during the years of the Almohad reign. Librarian Abu Bakr showed me some of the most priceless books in the collection. And this volume is actually illuminated and that some of the words are picked out in gold and this plate here. Written by Ibn Tumad, he describes in detail his interpretation of the finer points of the Quran. Oh! Look at that. You'd come in here obviously to learn, but this is just so uplifting visually as well. It's just such a privilege to see. It's just the richness of it. تجلت في الخصوص في ظهور شخصيات مرموقة في مختلف العلوم سواء في مجال الفكري أو التاريخ أو الطب والفلسفة وكذلك العلوم الشرعية وباقي العلوم الأخرى. One of the scholars who worked here, perhaps surprisingly, was Moses Maimonides, still regarded as the most important Jewish philosopher for the past 2,000 years. And this beautifully bookworm-ridden volume was written by another of the intellectual titans that were based here, the Andalusian philosopher Ibn Rashid, known in Europe as Averroes. Oh, look at that. Most famous for his commentary on the works of Aristotle, he was a significant link between the ideas of ancient Greece and medieval Europe. Page after page. On its extremely delicate, wafer-thin pages, are his thoughts on Islamic law. وعنوانه بداية المجتهد ونهاية المقتصد وكتاب في الفقه فهذه الفترة عرفت عرفت يعني ازدهارا فيما في فيما يتعلق بمجال التأليف. It's fascinating because these are figures who talk about Islamic studies, but they're putting it into a much wider intellectual context. Here, there are all of these great thinkers all working together, and they're pushing philosophy, pushing on astronomy, pushing on a number of great disciplines further than anywhere else in the area around the Mediterranean. We have in our religion, in our Islam, a statement that أن الحكمة هي ضالة المؤمن أينما وجدها يعني هو يبحث عن الحكمة أينما كانت فهو يستفيد ولا يتحرج أن ينفتح على كل العلوم سواء كانت علوم إسلامية أو غير إسلامية فهو يستفيد منها ويعني يحاول أن يوظفها في في علومه. These weren't just people. Who are interested in business, in conquering their neighbours. Just look at this. They knew beauty and they knew how to celebrate it. These are exquisite books. Absolutely exquisite. Directly outside the college, the atmosphere is peppered with the almost constant sound of hammering. The Medina is still a place of work. At the height of the Almohad Empire, Fez had 372 mills, 9,082 shops, 47 soap factories, and 188 pottery workshops. This wasn't so much as a market town as a center of industry. And in one corner of the Medina is an ancient industry as old as the city itself.
finding and protecting the priceless books and their precious contents was some of the finest leather in the world. And it's still made today, as it would have been during the Almohad's reign. The skins are first scraped free of hair and fat, then soaked in lime bars, before being softened in a mixture of guano and water. It's a process that is still remarkably natural. What do you actually use to dye? This is a herb that you're using to dye it. This is a herb that you're using to dye it. This is a herb that you're using to dye it. This is all natural. All so natural. this bright pink uh, yes. is a natural substance. So this process literally has remained unchanged for hundreds of years. Way before Henry Ford famously created his factory for assembling cars, the Berbers of Fez already had a production line. Intellectually and economically, the Almohads were in charge of an empire that ranked alongside the greatest of that time anywhere in the world. This was the high point of the Berber kingdom, but controlling such a massive realm brought its own problems. By the end of the 12th century, this fort at Rabat overlooked an armada of ships at anchor. The Almohads controlled substantial amounts of the Atlantic and Mediterranean coast, and armies were being carried by sea to far-off battlegrounds. Seaports like Rabat had become crucial, and by the end of the 12th century, the Almohads' greatest ruler, Yaqub el-Mansur, developed the town into his military headquarters. First came the fortification of the old town with ramparts and gates. And then, in 1195, something really grand. It had 400 columns and pillars. It was big enough to hold an entire army. And it would have been the largest mosque in the Islamic West, if not the entire Muslim world. As ambitious as the great Roman architecture of North Africa or the buildings of Mecca, it spoke to their heritage and to God, and it was as permanent a statement as could be made. But we'll never know if this would have been the grandest mosque in the world, as this isn't just a ruin, it's an unfulfilled dream. The reason why there's no top on the minaret or roof on the prayer hall here is that in 1199, only four years after work started, Yaqub el-Mansur died. The mosque remained in this unfinished state. His grand vision was never completed. El-Mansur was the last strong leader of the Almohads, and his death marked a critical turning point. It was the beginning of the end of the Almohad dynasty. Squabbles over his succession allowed rival Berber tribes to vie for power. And the weakness at the center had repercussions further afield. In Andalusia, a fundamentalist Christian crusade gained the upper hand against the equally fundamentalist Jihad. The Almohads were humiliated by the Christians in a decisive battle in Spain from which their army never really recovered. And the grip on Ifrica was lost as Arab tribes rebelled against the Almohad rulers. Professor El Faiz has studied the factors that led to the decline of the Almohad's Berber kingdom. If there are external factors, uh, Almohad army facing the Christian army in Spain, Yes. They don't succeed. They lost also the control of the Mediterranean Sea. So on every front, things yes, are collapsing in. Economic factors are very important uh, in the explanation of the decline. They, they, they don't uh, control the trade. There is no money, no budget to, to control population. Internally, 
they lose their tax revenue as local people begin to turn against yeah. them. The different ethnic groups then begin to fracture yeah. and fight yeah. against yes. the regime. And gradually, the empire begins to disintegrate. But it is that kind of that wheel, that problem of one of those factors breaking down means that the whole empire then begins to fail. All these factors contribute in time to the collapse of this dynasty. In 1269, Almohad rule ended when a rival Berber dynasty seized power in Marrakesh. The collapse of the Almohad Empire didn't happen overnight. It happened over decades. But nothing that followed could come even close to what they had achieved. None of the Berber dynasties that succeeded the Almohads was powerful enough to rule North Africa. Attempts to return to the glory days of the Almohads failed. In the 16th century, the Kingdom of Morocco was revived. But this vast palace was built by a different dynasty, claiming the right to rule as true interpreters of Islam. And these people saw themselves as Arabic, not Berber. The importance of Islam altered the identity of the kingdom. The same religious zeal that had brought the African Berbers an Islamic empire had ensured that it would be an Arab dynasty claiming direct descent to the Prophet Muhammad that would rule the kingdom that the Berber had created. An Arab dynasty is still in power today. After five centuries of Arab rule, many now think of Morocco as an Arab state with an Arab history. This is a kingdom with roots that are distinctly African. A group of indigenous nomads from the desert had achieved what no one else has ever done. They united a disparate group of Berber peoples under the banner of Islam and created an African empire that stretched into Europe. The Berber story deserves its place among the continent's great histories. The year is 1492. Christopher Columbus is about to embark on his world-shattering voyage to the Americas. And on his way to the coast, he stops off here at Granada. He's the honored guest of a ceremony hosted by the King and Queen of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella. They are celebrating a grand victory. Up until this day, Granada had been ruled by Muslims. But Isabella has managed to wrestle control from them. Ferdinand and Isabella's victory marks a turning point for Spain and for Europe. The Middle Ages are over and the West is about to embark on a new epoch of power and discovery. We tend to think of this as the beginning of an era. In fact, it's the climax of a forgotten chapter in European history. The rise and fall of Islam in the West. Rudyard Kipling, who wrote, East is East and West is West, and never the twain shall meet. 
and it's a worldview that still has currency today. Islam and Christianity seem to have become ideological monoliths, citadels whose gates are firmly closed to one another. But they haven't always lived such separate lives. In the year 711 AD, Muslim forces invaded Spain and created a society so rich and so powerful it was the envy of the known world. This wasn't the rigid, ferocious Islam of our imaginations, but a progressive, sensuous, intellectually curious culture that for a number of spine-tingling years looks set to sweep through the whole of Europe. It is an incredible story, but one that has been systematically written out of history. After the Catholic monarchs took over the city of Granada, they began to destroy all evidence that the Muslims had ever been in Spain. In the following century, the Spanish authorities persecuted and expelled 300,000 Muslims and burned as many as a million Arabic books. This was an astonishing act of ethnic cleansing. It put an end to a civilization which had flourished in Spain for 700 years. These people have become known as the Moors. Propaganda, sparked by the Crusades, has given us an enduring image, the diabolical Moor of dark-skinned, savage, alien enemy. But this character is a complete invention and tells us nothing about who these people really were. Now, archaeologists and historians are starting to piece together the real story of the Moors in Spain. They're uncovering the remains of hidden cities, discovering the role of Muslims in the revival of the classics and decoding the meaning of Islamic buildings. A fascinating picture has emerged. I'm going to use this new research to explore what happened when East met West in Europe. If there is one place which challenges the stereotype of the treacherous, bloodthirsty Moor, it's here, the Alhambra Palace in Granada. The Alhambra is one of the most complete medieval Islamic palaces in the whole world. It was built by the Muslim kings of Granada in the 14th century at the height of their power. Its name means the red one because the dark surrounding soil has given its stones an earthy reddish hue. The marvel of the Alhambra is its mystery. Not a single account of life here survives. All its archives were incinerated in the fires of the Inquisition. But the Catholics couldn't bring themselves to destroy this place. The Alhambra is one of the wonders of the medieval world. And by preserving it, they've kept a box of secrets that we can use to decode the civilization that built it. Inside the palace walls, the architecture is breathtaking. Although the aesthetic of this courtyard is quite cool and minimal now, in its heyday, it would have been a riot of colour. Granada was very famous for producing silks. And you've had silk hangings billowing in the breeze and silk cushions and silk rugs where people laid out to eat their dinner and to listen to music. And in fact, it's only when you get down to rug level that you appreciate one of the bits of magic of the place. Because from down here, this pool acts like a kind of infinity mirror and the whole of the palace just looks as if it's suspended in water. Every detail of the palace decoration seems to be part of a scheme. Row upon row of intricate geometric patterns are carved into the woodwork of the walls and windows. This is the throne room. It was the symbolic centre of the palace, and here the Sultan had a kind of psychological advantage over his subjects. 
Whereas he'd have stood here in an eerie silhouette, they'd have been blinded by the light that came streaming in through these brightly coloured stained glass windows. The 19th century writer Washington Irving observed, it's impossible to contemplate this abode of oriental manners without feeling the early association of Arabian romance. One almost expects to see some dark eye sparkling through the lattice. The abode of beauty is here, as if it had been inhabited but yesterday. But this is far more than just a beautiful building. There's a specific reason why it feels so harmonious. The men who built it had a knowledge of complex geometry which had originated in the ancient world. The first man to set down these mathematical principles was the Greek philosopher Pythagoras. Pythagoras saw numbers everywhere in the universe, but his brilliance was to understand the importance of the ratio between them. Professor Antonio Fernandez Puertas has spent his life studying the Alhambra. He's discovered that the whole of the building, from the ground plan to the wall decoration, is based around one single ratio. I think it's, everything is so perfect because it's, everything is under control of the proportion. And very, very simple. You notice that there is something magic about these buildings. There is something marvelous in your surroundings. It's very, very simple. It's the relation between the ground and the elevations of the buildings. It's as simple as that. The king ordered a new palace. He has a limited area to build the palace. To west, east and south, he was limited. Then he did something genius, ingenious and beautiful. The king of Granada asked his architects to harmonize each and every space within the palace according to a single set of proportions, a family of rectangles, each related to the other. If you want to get proportional rectangle, you have the same base. Take the diagonal, put it up, you know, yes. and uh, you got successive rectangle, proportional rectangle, the key to the Alhambra's design is the simple relationship between the side of a square and its diagonal. If we use the diagonal to make a rectangle, and then the diagonal from that rectangle to make another, we get a progression of rectangles. The fourth rectangle is double the size of the first, and the diagonals in this sequence are in fact the square roots of two, three, four, and five. A magical sequence. And are they doing all this just with two set squares oh, right. and a piece of string? Yes. That's very clever. Yes. Every part of the intricate network of spaces, all the courtyards, the hallways, the placement of every column was designed using inspired variations of this proportional system. Proportion is also in the elevation. You have the kiosk. Here you build a square and with the diagonal you swing it up. Nothing violated this incredibly elaborate system. The Alhambra is a triumph of mathematics as much as it is of aesthetics. Mathematical ingenuity is the root of its beauty. But no one talks about this. Everyone looks at the Alhambra just as an aesthetic experience. When you go to a concert and you listen to Mozart, you listen to uh, Beethoven, you listen to uh, Verdi, you don't know perhaps music, but you notice that there is something magic. Yes. It happens with that the same. You feel it. The Alhambra is so enchanting, it's all too easy to view it as a fairy tale palace, isolated from history.
but that is romantic nonsense. This palace was the product of a very real, very gritty history. The Alhambra was built by a religious empire which, at the pinnacle of its power, dominated land from China to Africa. An empire which had the wealth and intellect to build such masterpieces. An empire whose history goes back to the deserts of 7th century Arabia. The Alhambra was the creation of the richest, most intellectually powerful civilization in the world. The roots of this cultural and religious explosion lie not in Spain, but in the deserts of Arabia. At the beginning of the 7th century in Saudi Arabia, something happened which was to change the religious makeup of the world forever. A merchant called Muhammad asserted that he had been visited by the Archangel Gabriel who had revealed to him the true words of God. These revelations, which came to Muhammad throughout his life, became known as the Quran. And the religion was Islam. This is a time when people were experimenting with all sorts of cults and religions, many of which fell by the wayside. But the Prophet Muhammad and his followers made an important move. They travelled to a desert oasis where they founded a city called Medina. With a foothold in Medina, Islam was no longer just a nomadic desert cult. It had an urban centre with a social structure. As the religion grew bigger, so it grew more ambitious. Territorial expansion was a characteristic of nomadic Arabs well before the arrival of Muhammad. Tribal leaders would initiate razzia or raids on their neighbours. And with the advent of Islam, these gained some kind of spiritual significance. This is what one commander was reported to have said in one of the earliest ever Arabic chronicles. This land is your inheritance and the promise of your Lord. You've been tasting it and eating from it. You have been killing its people and taking them into captivity. You are Arab chiefs and notables. If you renounce this world and aspire to the hereafter, God will give you this world and the hereafter. They believed they were inspired by the power of God. Within decades, Islamic Arabs had reached as far as Persia in the east. In the west, they'd conquered Egypt, Jordan and much of North Africa and were within spitting distance of Europe. But Islam wasn't only interested in territorial expansion. It was also a faith committed to the pursuit of learning. Among the Prophet's first revelations was the instruction, seek knowledge. This meant that from the very earliest days of Islam, literacy and religious study went hand in hand. Whereas a number of other religions of the day preferred to keep literacy the privilege of a clerical elite, Islam actively encouraged it. In the ancient Muslim city of Fez in Morocco, there are many examples of this unique integration of religion and education. This is the Karouin Mosque in Fez, and it's still the heart of religious life here. It was founded in 859 by a woman, both as a religious and as an educational establishment. Mosques were used for teaching grammar and literacy to ordinary people. In time, colleges, known as madrasas, were set up. This is the madrasa Bu Inania. Its walls are covered with the rich, rhyming prose of the Quran. The mosque is only part of the complex, which contains both it and the madrasa. When the Sultan Abu Anan founded the place, 
He built the mosque alongside Madrasa. It is most symbolic. The mosque, built for prayer, was also a place which encouraged education and learning. As you can see, there is no separation. When the Quran was given to the Prophet, who was illiterate, the angel told him, read. These inscriptions carved onto the walls are verses of poetry and can be found throughout the madrasa. But I think the most important section is here. What it says in Arabic is, I am the apogee of knowledge. Come, you Muslims. Come and learn, because with knowledge you can become what you want to be in the future. During the medieval period, knowledge was high on the agenda in the Islamic world. Muslim societies produced many books in the various spheres of knowledge and these books came to be known worldwide. It wasn't just an enlightened attitude to reading which placed learning at the heart of the Islamic world. Necessity was also the mother of invention. Because the Arabs were nomads and desert traders who often had to travel in the cool of the night, they were well versed in using the stars as guiding devices. This developed into a very sophisticated study of astronomy. Then with the establishment of Islam, that knowledge was applied in a new way. Whenever a mosque was built, the prayer niche had to be orientated in direct relation to Mecca. And there were a number of religious festivals that had to fall on certain days in the lunar year. These were complex mathematical problems for which the Muslims devised precise solutions. Islam became a culture which naturally embraced scientific and mathematical investigation. This uninhibited attitude towards learning meant that when Muslims encountered the teachings of other cultures, they seized upon them vigorously. In the very early days of Islam, Muslims came into contact with a body of knowledge which had been ignored by most of Northern Europe for centuries. The works of the ancient Greeks. It's once you look at a globe that it becomes particularly easy to understand why the Arabs were such natural inheritors of Greek learning. From the Bronze Age onwards, there'd been a constant exchange of artifacts and information all across the Eastern Mediterranean. And in fact, a number of Greek ideas stem from Eastern and Egyptian influences. The bulk of this knowledge was preserved in the great schools and library at Alexandria. And then in 641 AD, the Arabs take over the city and at a stroke have direct access to this precious learning. Many of these texts found their way to Fez. This is an Arabic translation of Aristotle with an additional commentary by the Muslim scholar Averroes. The translation is done in Iraq and then Averroes does this commentary in Al-Andalus. There's even an early Arabic translation of the Bible. So it's extraordinary, isn't it, that Arabic's the, the, the lingua franca, then everybody's writing in Arabic, even the Bible. And that ends the Gospel of Mark the Apostle. The contrast with Europe at this time could not have been greater. Here, ancient Greek texts and the rational investigation they contained were often feared as blasphemous. When the Prophet Muhammad was born, Christianity had already been battling with paganism for 600 years trying to persuade believers to turn away from their old gods to the one new god. And because of that, Christians were often suspicious of Greek and Roman pagan texts. For instance, in 529 AD, the Christian emperor Justinian closed down the Athenian schools of philosophy. Set against this vibrant Islamic culture, 
Europe can appear an introspective and intellectually cautious place. It was certainly a continent in crisis. After the fall of Rome, there was a power vacuum in Europe, with rival tribes squabbling for territories. It was the start of what later Christian scholars would describe as the Dark Ages. While Europe lay unprotected and vulnerable, Islam was consolidating land and power. By the beginning of the 8th century, the Arabs had converted the Berber tribes at the very tip of North Africa. And before long, troops were gathered on the coast, their eyes fixed on Europe. This little stretch of water between Spain and Morocco is only nine miles wide. But it's come to represent some kind of cultural chasm between Europe and Africa. But in the 8th century, when sea travel was the way to get around, that wasn't a barrier, it was a highway. In July 711, 7,000 Berber tribesmen stormed across the Straits of Gibraltar and invaded Europe. The Muslims then began an incredible process of expansion. In just four years, they'd colonized almost the whole of Spain, had crossed the Pyrenees and were only halted at Poitiers in France. Were it not for this reverse, an army which had swept across two continents might easily have crossed the English Channel and occupied Britain. The Muslims called the country they came to Al-Andalus, the land of the Vandals. This refers to the Germanic tribe who ruled Spain at the time, the Visigoths. Spanish historians have traditionally seen the Muslim invasion of Spain as a terrible and violent attack, an assault on Christian Europe. In fact, here at the Visigothic site of Rocopolis near Madrid, archaeologists have found evidence which offers a rather different explanation. The city of Rocopolis, in fact, uh, was the uh, royal city founded by the Visigoths in order to demonstrate the power of the new state. The dimensions were spectacular for this period. And this complex is the, the most important discovery in Western Europe. What was it at the time that the, the Muslims were invading? Well, what was the state of the city then? They found it not only here in this part of Iberia, but in everywhere of the Al-Andalus. Uh, uh, they found it uh, cities in crisis. A social crisis, of urban crisis. The traditional explanation is this idea that when the Arabs came, the society collapses and the city collapses. It's not true. It's not true. The collapse of the city started during the Visigothic period. If you read the orthodox Spanish histories, then you'll learn that predatory Muslim hordes forcibly appropriated Visigothic Spain. And there certainly were some invasion battles. But at many places, like here at Rocopolis, it seems that the newcomers were actually welcomed with open arms. We even have treaties where the Visigoths enthusiastically hand over their land in return for effective Muslim protection. When you were excavating, did, did you find any evidence of violence at the time of the Arab invasion? We don't have evidence of violence. Not, not at all. In, in this area was a peaceful, and the archaeology is showing another landscape, no, another explanation too. The Muslims started to build a new society. The enthusiasm for learning that the Islamic world had spent years nurturing was about to be transmitted to Europe. 
We went into Spain not to fight against the people there, but to save them from the tyranny of the Latins and others that governed them at the time. In Al-Andalus, they found a paradise on earth. When the Arabs changed location, changed geography from their inhospitable barren homeland and moved to a rich and fertile country, this was to transform the Arab mind. This is the secret of how such a great civilization came to be born. The foundations of a new society had been laid. A self-confident, progressive and sophisticated civilization had arrived among the failing states of Europe. And the continent's history was about to be transformed. The Muslim invasion of Spain had been swift and effective, but it lacked a strong leadership. The first wave of invaders were North African tribesmen, only recently converted to Islam and without connections to the power base of Arabia. But this was about to change. In the capital of the Muslim world, a political coup left all the members of the ruling dynasty massacred. All that is except for one, a prince called Abd al-Rahman. Abd al-Rahman was in his late teens when his family was massacred. He managed to escape the slaughter and fled to the hills west of Damascus. His mother had been from North Africa, and Abd al-Rahman must have grown up hearing tales of Al-Andalus. And so he made a dangerous journey across the Nile and the deserts of Egypt, heading for those distant lands. Abd al-Rahman brought culture and learning from the center of the Islamic world straight to the heart of Al-Andalus. When Abd al-Rahman arrived in Spain, he came here to Cordoba, where the city was in complete disarray. That Roman bridge had collapsed into the river. But Abd al-Rahman set to rebuilding the city. You have to remember that it's in this context that the Arabs arrive, not as marauding destroyers, but sometimes as saviors. Abd al-Rahman brought cutting-edge technology for irrigation to Spain. Almost immediately, the landscape was transformed. Palm trees, lemon and orange groves, avocados, artichokes and pomegranates, none of which had been seen in Europe. Because of Abd al-Rahman's sophisticated trade network, this new agriculture created huge wealth. And these riches were used to build one of the greatest cities in the world. While the inhabitants of London were still living in wooden houses, the people of Cordoba had built a cosmopolitan city with a population of over 100,000, the largest settlement in Europe. Reports from European visitors to Cordoba describe a city with 70 libraries and over 300 public baths. The accounts tell of houses with running water and roads illuminated by streetlights. You often have to take medieval sources with a fairly substantial pinch of salt because um, chroniclers were extremely fond of exaggeration. But, in fact, the new excavations here at Cordoba are actually revealing a city that was just as rich as the one that they described. These monumental palace walls belong to a Muslim aristocrat, and this channel over here is part of the water system that brought Cordoba its famously effective sewage works, as well as the fountains and the baths that so impressed all those European visitors. 
Cordoba was described by a 10th century German visitor as the ornament of the world. One of the reasons it's been so difficult to investigate Islamic Cordoba is that the city's been built up on itself like a kind of layer cake. But here, the archaeologists have taken away the modern level to reveal that Islamic layer there, and then down at the bottom, a Roman mosaic. Abdel Rahman built Cordoba on top of what had been one of the largest cities in Roman Spain, outshining all that went before. And his greatest achievement was this, the Great Mosque of Cordoba. With a floor space the size of four football pitches, this is the largest mosque in Western Islam. The forest of 600 marble columns disappear into the distance, creating a mesmeric infinity effect. On the columns, arches balance on top of one another. Its shell-shaped prayer niche has an extraordinary acoustic making any word spoken inside audible to the entire congregation. When the mosque was first built, these archways would have been opened to allow people and light to stream in and out. And this courtyard was a central part of the complex. People would come here to ritually purify themselves before they worshipped, or just to gossip and do business. Abdul Rahman's original mosque was only a fraction of the size of the building that stands today. Over a period of 200 years, rulers would extend the mosque three times. It's been suggested that the mosque was enlarged because each new ruler of the city wanted to stamp his authority on the building. But there's also a more straightforward explanation. The Cordoba Mosque had to accommodate the burgeoning number of worshippers. The Muslim population of Spain was growing fast. Modern Spain has been reluctant to acknowledge that its indigenous population converted to Islam in droves. The standard history books present the Muslim occupation of Spain as something that was superficial, just a surface colonization by an Arab elite, not a presence that had any kind of lasting impact on the bulk of the population. New archaeological evidence is turning that idea on its head. All over Spain, cities like Cordoba were established. Even Madrid was founded by Muslims. The original Arab walls still stand behind the royal palace. How far did Muslim communities spread through Spain? We see remains dating from the time of Al-Andalus almost everywhere. Not only in the south of Spain, but also in other parts of Spain. There are emerging lots of sites, fortresses, villages and cities almost everywhere. People were Arabized, losing the form of Latin they were speaking until then, and they were Islamized in the sense that they dropped Christianity and converted to Islam in um, massive numbers. Really. Were these forced conversions, or was the idea of Islam particularly attractive? It's always very difficult to say why someone converts to another religion, but uh, I think 
th th there is no evidence on, of any force, uh, force, uh, forced conversion at all. In a way, the uh, Islamization and Arabization of uh, territories like Al Andalus is very similar to what happened to the uh, Roman Empire when people wanted to convert to the values and to the cultural values, to the religious values, and to the way of living of what seemed to be a, a civilization which had uh, lots of advantages. I think it's very easy to forget that, that, that at this moment in time, Islam is a culture of, of innovation, isn't it? As you said, it's drawing in ideas from the East. It's a culture of uh, phenomenal innovation. The opportunities of living because of the market, because of the trade relations and so on, which were much more interesting. The Islamization of Spain did more than change the name of the god that people worshipped. People converted because this was a religion which had something to offer them. It had wealth, it had social structure, and it had intellectual power. The Arabs brought in one innovation that did more than any other to change the cultural makeup of Europe. And it's this paper. The idea almost certainly came from the Chinese via trade exchange and it is revolutionary technology. Unlike parchment and vellum, it's cheap and it's easy to mass produce. And when the Arabs come to Spain, they start to open paper-making factories. Paper allows you to do three things very effectively. You can gather information, you can analyze and develop ideas in a very precise way, and then you can disseminate your newfound knowledge to a wider world. And in the 10th century, that was a potent mix. Cordoba's love of books became legendary. Whilst the Royal Library of France contained 900 books in this period, just one of Cordoba's 70 libraries amassed over half a million. These books contain some of the most sophisticated studies of astronomy in the world. In Northern Europe at this time, there is nothing. But there is nothing that can be considered uh, the result of sophisticated astronomy. Why do you think Muslim scholars were particularly interested in, in the heavens and, and the revolution of the stars? I think they were interested in science in general terms. For example, calculating the sacred direction. If you have to say your prayers, you must face towards Mecca. Calculating the direction of Mecca from a given place is not so easy. It is a complicated mathematical problem for which the Arabs had exact solutions from the 9th century. One of the ways in which the Muslims solved these problems was by developing a Greek instrument called the astrolabe. This is a calculator for telling the time of night or day. If it's lined up on a star above the horizon, the angle could be registered with a movable needle. The measurement is then transferred to the reverse side of the astrolabe, where a base plate represents the geographical location. And a star grid, like a map of the heavens, shows the position of the stars. By aligning the needle to the grid using the measurements, the time can be read off the face of the astrolabe, just like a clock. The astrolabe enabled nighttime navigation, which helped to advance sea travel. And this, in turn, set the stage for the coming era of worldwide exploration and discovery. Cordoban scientists were streets ahead of the rest of Europe, especially when it came to medicine. This account comes from an Islamic physician who encountered a Christian doctor at work. They brought me a knight who had an abscess on his leg and a woman suffering from consumption. I made a plaster for the knight and the swelling opened and improved. For the woman, I prescribed a diet to revive her consumption. But then the Frankish doctor arrived and objected. Bring me a strong knight with a well-sharpened battle axe, he said. The knight struck a blow, the marrow of the leg spurted out and the wounded man died on the spot. As for the woman, their doctor affirmed the devil must have entered her head. 
Then he grasped a razor and cut an incision in the shape of a cross, exposing the bone of the skull and rubbing salt into the wound. The woman died in the instant. I returned home, having learned much about the medicine of the Christians. The hospitals of Cordoba were performing operations which wouldn't be seen in the rest of Europe for hundreds of years. The city's most famous surgeon was a man called Abu Qasis. He spent 40 years compiling a hugely influential medical compendium. Chapter 30 dealt with surgery, and these are just some of the instruments that were illustrated in that chapter. This is a specialist device used by eye surgeons for the relief of hypertension. And these two over here were employed to perform successful tracheotomies. And in fact, the abukasis method was still popular well into the 20th century. As well as large scientific collections, more everyday documents have survived from Islamic Cordoba. These give a detailed insight to the society that was created here. What kinds of things are being recorded on these bits of paper? In this document, there was written everything, absolutely everything. So does that mean that people in the lower classes of society could read? Yes, they are poor people with a very good education. The education is a way to be a better Muslim. So being a better Muslim is, is means that you know the Quran and you know everything of the law. The law is not a king law. It is a God law. Divine law. Divine law. Have, have you got any physical examples of these yes, documents? Yes, I have, I have one. Well, it is a contract about plowing the land. Uh, for two years, we have to plant it with wheat and food, and he gets from this, this proportion of the production. The Muslims give a new thing. The land is mine. I rent you the land, and you give me a part of the production. People are interested not in having hunting lands, like a lord or squire in England. The landlord rent his land. And it's empowering as well, because if you're the lowest rung of society, and yet you have some rights to your own land, and you can keep a lot of the produce. Yes. Every piece of evidence from Cordoba adds to the picture of a civilized and highly sophisticated city. It had medical centers, an organized legal system, and libraries full of academics and scientists working on ideas which were light years ahead of anything else in Europe. By the 10th century, Cordoba had become the official capital of Al-Andalus. People flocked here to work, either in the city's shops and markets, or on rented land outside. In the year 912, a new ruler came to power. He was to take Cordoba to even greater heights. Abdel Rahman III was only 21 when he became ruler of Cordoba. With a resounding statement of self-confidence, he declared himself the Caliph, the Commander-in-Chief of the Faithful. With that title, he claimed to be the supreme leader of the Islamic world. At a stroke, he repositioned Muslim Spain, so it was no longer a Western outpost, but instead a key power in Islam. And to complement his role as Caliph, Abd al-Rahman III built himself one of the biggest royal palaces in the world. While the English kings of the same period were living in modest wooden halls, Abd al-Rahman III needed 10,000 workmen to construct this enormous palace complex, which was decorated with African white marble. The Alabaster Palace, surrounded by acres of date palms, was described as a concubine lying in the arms of a black eunuch. It was called Medina al-Zahra, 
after the caliph's favourite. Archaeologists have reconstructed barely 10% of the original site. The idea here is that the caliph dominates. What he's really doing with the landscape is demonstrating that Medina Alfara is the strongest territory in the peninsula. Our excavations reveal the city to be at the cutting edge of technical, architectural and scientific development. Now, to do this on such an enormous scale requires incredible sophistication. Nothing like this existed in the world. At the center of the complex lies Abd al-Rahman's throne room. What do you think drove Abd al-Rahman to build such an opulent place? Abd al-Rahman had this built during the last year of his life. It was a symbol of consolidation of his economic and political power. Seated in this throne, the caliph must have felt himself master of all Al-Andalus' destiny. Visitors from all over Europe were received here. A monk from Germany called John of Gorse left a record of his trip. You have to try and imagine the impression this place would have made on John of Gorse. The walls were studded with tiles made of silver and gold. And on the roof, there was a massive representation of the heavens. Mechanical lions roared in the corridors, and in the rafters, there were mechanical birds that twittered away. Here in the center of the room, there were two bowls filled with mercury that would catch the light and then send it shattering back out to dazzle the visitors. This is what was written about the climax of his visit. When John arrived at the dais where the caliph was seated alone, almost like a godhead, he saw everything draped with rare and costly coverings. They do not use thrones or chairs as other people do, but recline on divans or couches when conversing or eating, their legs crossed over one another. There is actually one detail that this account misses out. The caliph did have a throne, a mechanical throne, that raised and then descended as if he was levitating among his subjects. A refined court culture developed in the palace of Medina al zahra and this was to have an unexpected influence on the rest of Europe. What would the soundscapes of the palaces have been in the 10th century? Perhaps the most basic level would be the sounds of all the different fountains and small running currents, artificial rivers running from room to room. On top of that, we could have heard layer upon layer of different types of music and singing. A variety of different professional instrumentalists. We could easily have heard a lute player sitting in a corner or in any of the various different entryways. There would be a slightly more formal presentation of a singing girl. What were these singers expected to do? Were they concubines as well? Well, in some sense, we're doing an injustice by just referring to them as singers. These women were entertainers at every level. They had to be able to converse. They had to be able to discuss intelligent subjects. They had to be able to compose poetry, recite poetry. For Arabs, poetry is the single most important art of their culture. If we look at a picture of the entire world, there are only three cultures that we know of that had developed end rhyme by the seventh century, China, India, and the Arabs. This early Arabic love poetry directly influenced the development of literature in the rest of Europe. One of the primary characteristics of this poetry is a constant focus on the feelings of the lover. The poet is always complaining of the pangs of love and the distance of the beloved, and we, quite frankly, almost never hear from the beloved. Love is a welcome malady. Those who are free of it want not to be immune. And those who are stricken want not to be cured. 
pain of separation and unrequited love are concepts that are very familiar to us. And there is a direct connection to that early Arab poetry. In England, some of our earliest and most enduring stories are romantic tales of knights and damsels, a courtly love tradition brought here by travelling French poets called troubadours. And those troubadours were inspired by the singing slave girls of Al-Andalus. The courtly love tradition has long been seen as something European. It came to form the basis of the Western concept of romantic love. But this cornerstone of our culture originated in Islamic Spain. Perhaps one of the most exciting moments, the transfer, if you will, of Arab music and poetry from the south to the north happens in the year 1064 in the city of Barbastro. Neighboring French knights besiege the city, which falls. Its booty includes hundreds of singing girls who go to the second in command, William VIII of Aquitaine. He would receive a large number of Moorish singing girls, which he then took back with him to France. He died at a fairly young age, and his heir, William IX, inherited this household at age 15. And William IX is known to us in literary history as the first troubadour. So it's almost positive that William the Ninth would not only have grown up as a child in a household in which there were Arab singing girls, but at the age of 15, he actually became their master. It's one of the few moments where we can say that there's a transfer of singing girls from this point to that point, and then the point of reception is precisely where the first flourishing of troubadour poetry emerges. But the glorious court of Medina al-Zahra was not to last forever. Within the palace were sown the very seeds of its destruction. Abd al-Rahman III had invested much of his money and interest in art and culture and had paid very little attention to the military. There were no generals at court and citizens didn't have to serve in the army. This is important. The mere fact that the army can't recruit from its own citizens means that it has to recruit more and more foreigners, effectively mercenaries. This is part of the reason for the conflict which led to the ultimate collapse of the caliphate. When an ambitious courtier usurped the caliphate, the court split into factions. Once the 300-year-old dynasty cracked, it didn't take long for the palace to come under attack. Medina al-Zahra was quickly smashed and plundered. These are the telltale signs that the palace was violently destroyed. They're scorch marks on the marble made when the molten lead that supported the joists in the roof melted as the palace was burnt to the ground. Of course, the history of Spain would have been very different if Medina al-Zahra had continued to exist and if the caliphate had not disappeared. Rahman III's unique dynasty had come to a terrible end. And in the north of the country, another religious power was eyeing up the rich lands of Al-Andalus. Its name was Christendom. Andalus's golden age was over. By the beginning of the 11th century, Abd al-Rahman's dynasty in Cordoba had collapsed into chaos and disorder. But what happened next was even more devastating. In 1095, Pope Urban II made a call to arms. 
he ordered a war to remove Islam from the Holy Lands. Pope Eben's speech is agitprop at its finest. When an armed attack is made against an enemy, let there be one resounding cry from the soldiers of God. It is the will of God. It is the will of God. The Crusades had begun. It didn't take long for this zealous warrior mentality to rouse the Christians of northern Spain. And what followed was as treacherous as any of the Crusades in the Holy Lands. The Christians had always held on to the far north of the country, and now they were gaining ground. Al-Andalus had fragmented into a hodgepodge of isolated city-states. Suddenly, Muslim Spain found herself under attack. Her palaces were raided and her cities laid to siege. Between the 11th and the 13th centuries, an army of Christian kings took over the lands of Al-Andalus. Every year, this conflict is reenacted in towns across Spain. Christianos. This, the victor's version of history, glamorizes what was actually a dishonorable and dirty war. When the Christian comes, they break everything. They come in summer when the wheat is almost dry. They, they put it fine. After that, they cut the trees. The agriculture of Al-Andalus was very sophisticated. The more sophisticated is something, the more fragile it is. So the more easy it is to break it. Irrigation. If you break a canal, there is no more water. So for some years, people are starving. So it's a scorched earth policy. Yes. Soon, a brutal system of protection rackets emerged. There is an alternative. You pay me, I don't destroy. I don't burn your house. How much do you give me? I don't cut your trees. Uh, how much do you give me? This one. It is a, it is a way of the mafia in, in Chicago. For one century, all the 11th century, all the Christian Spain lives at expense of Muslim Spain. One by one, the fragmented city-states of Al-Andalus were terrorized. Their solution was to fight fire with fire by bringing in troops from Morocco. This is the capital from the top of a column in Cordoba. It's a buzzing little scene. You've got four musicians, two who are playing pipes and two who are playing the lute. But at some point, the faces of the musicians have been smashed in. This wasn't perpetrated by Christian raiders, but by the new Muslim power who had come to help Al-Andalus. The troops who came as military support were strict fundamentalists with a fearsome fighting reputation. They were called the Almoravids. The Almoravids were a tribe of nomads from the Sahara. They had black skin and wore veils that covered everything apart from their eyes. When they went into battle, they rode light-footed, versatile little horses and took with them camels and elephants. But they were fiercest of all when it came to religion. They preached a return to basic Muslim values, and when they came to Al-Andalus, they were shocked by what they found. There are people from the desert, that is people newborn to the religion, so they have a hard feeling of it. Evangelical Islam. Yeah, absolutely. Not accustomed to civilization. Yeah. What did they think had gone wrong with Islam here? They felt they had to purify things. They said, this is people uh, very accustomed to civilization, to science. They're talking with Christians, with Jews. This is a mix that we don't like it. We, we want purified people. With the barbaric Christian raiders on one side and these new fundamentalist Muslims on the other, 
Al-Andalus was crushed. It descended into corruption. A Christian king would provide military aid to a weak Muslim king in return for a substantial payment of gold coin. The whole of Al-Andalus was subjected to this system of extortion. The trouble is, modern Spain chooses to remember this war rather differently. La Reconquista, the Reconquest, is presented as a valiant crusade in which Spain is returned to its rightful Christian owners. This pantomime version of history is personified in many of Spain's national heroes, the greatest of whom is a knight called Guzman el Bueno. Every town in Spain has a street named after Guzman el Bueno. He's one of the country's best-loved historical figures. The story of when Guzman defended the town of Tarifa from Muslim raids is well known in Spain. Guzman's descendants, the Medina Sidonia family, became one of the richest landowners in the country. The Duchess of Medina Sidonia has discovered something remarkable about her illustrious ancestor. Guzman el Bueno is the first of the Guzman family we know about. He is the founder of the family. He came here and lived in this very house. This is the family archive, although it's more than that. It is a rich source of documents from the medieval period and later. Was it right that one of your ancestors was involved in the Spanish Armada? The seventh duke was involved in that campaign. This document dates from 1288. We know my ancestor was in Al-Andalus a year before because he bought a farm. And this document mentions it. It's a permit for him to export 300 bushels of wheat. Look, you can see the word wheat. And what it says is that he is allowed to take this overseas to where he is from. So... Because of the grammar, you can tell that he comes from overseas, not that he was just visiting from overseas. Well, pues, sí, probablemente. Yes, probably it refers to a place which was part of Morocco, much larger then than now, a place where neither wheat nor hay could grow. The Duchess had discovered that her ancestor, the great Christian knight, Guzman el Bueno, was actually a Muslim. This is really a piece of human history. It dates to 1297. The king refers to Guzman as my vassal because he is a foreigner. Guzman the vassal. If it wasn't written here, I wouldn't believe it. It was very common for Muslims to ally themselves with Christian factions, especially when Christians were warring with each other. It must have been a, quite a surprise to discover that your, your ancestor was a Muslim. Yes, a great surprise. This is because there had been a chronicle which dated back to the 16th century, in which the Guzman family had cleaned up its political and ethnic past. Guzman was said to have been born in León. They didn't just do this with the Guzman family, but with all the families that had doubtful ancestors, ancestors of doubtful race. They cleaned it all up. We have a whole load of documents here from the Spanish register, and they turn everything we know about Spanish history upside down. The Spanish are simply inventing history. They have turned history into a fable. 
The idea that the Christians and the Muslims were fighting a holy war was created in Spain long after the reconquest actually took place. Even Spain's most famous hero, the swashbuckling El Cid, is caught up in this fantasy. In films and books, El Cid is celebrated as a kind of Christian pin-up. A crusader in the fight against the terrible Moor. But El Cid spent his life, like El Bueno, as a mercenary. Fighting for whomsoever would pay him. The name Cid means the master in Arabic. So El Cid's an Arabic name? Yes. In fact, he was the king of Valencia when Valencia was a, an Islamic city and he didn't change anything there. So he had Muslim allies? That's it. Yeah. That's not the story you hear, is it? No, I think the, the history is much more interesting than the history you hear. So he was a Christian king, but he didn't force the Muslims that he controlled to convert? No, no, he, he was... In fact, I, we cannot see uh, the Reconquist as a process of conversion. This is a process of trial and error, of people uh, gaining lands and people gaining prestige. It's, it's just real politics. It's, it's all about getting That's land. That's it. We are painting now everything with an um, religious ideology, but it's not. So religion's a kind of convenient excuse rather than the driving force. Absolutely. Uh, religion is always an excuse. El Cid and Guzman El Bueno weren't simply Christian soldiers fighting a Muslim enemy. If anything, this was a civil war, with both sides desperately scrabbling for land and wealth. The idea that the Reconquest was something cut and dried, black and white, something that cleaned up society is absurd. I don't know who came up with that idea. The Spanish historian Palencia said that the Reconquista was nothing but a civil war between Spaniards of two different faiths. Spain is full of dazzling reminders of how the righteous Christians won the country back from the diabolical Moor. The country's most popular saint is called Santiago Matamoros, St. James the Moor Slayer. But this romanticized version of history distorts the true nature of this conflict. This was not a holy war. Al-Andalus was destroyed in a dirty grab for land, which lasted for over 300 years. And in this conflict, the more refined society was the one least equipped for war. It was the Christians who had little to lose and most to gain. And what happened when the Christians began to take over exposes a curious respect for Muslim culture. When the Christian King Peter took control of Seville in 1248, this is what he had made. It is a beautiful building. It was built for a Christian and yet in every way it resembles an Islamic palace. On the walls there are inscriptions from the Quran and above the door there are dedications to its owner calling him Caliph rather than King. The conqueror has been conquered by the culture It's a tiny bit unexpected that when this Christian king rebuilt this palace, he made it appear so Arabic. It feels as if we're in the Alhambra here. Well, this uh, palace has many relations with the Alhambra, especially with the court of lions. Both builders, King Muhammad V of Granada and King uh, Peter I of uh, Castile, were uh, friends. You have to consider that in Europe, at this time, there was not an architecture of such a splendor. 
comparable to al -Andalus. And this made a, a very big attraction for the Christians. And this is why this architecture was used by the Christian to show to the nobility of the kingdom the power, the authority, uh, this room covered with this marvelous dome. It symbolizes the power because it's the, the heavens that turns around the, the king. But the legacy of Al-Andalus was to affect more than the architecture of Europe. In the midst of this terrible struggle, something incredible was to happen, which would fire the minds of Europeans and expand our intellectual horizons. At the same time that it was being splintered by Christian encroachment, Al-Andalus was at the centre of one of the most influential shifts in thinking that Europe has ever seen. Between the Middle Ages and the modern era, Europe underwent a massive intellectual and cultural revolution. This shift known as the Renaissance, transformed the human experience. It prompted the exploration of science and the arts and changed the way that men and women saw themselves in relation to God. The Renaissance and the scientific revolution that followed were critical stages in the development of Europe. The origins of the Renaissance are generally believed to lie in Italy, where a renewed interest in the classics had a huge impact on art and culture. But the foundations of the Renaissance were laid much earlier, and not in Italy, but in a town called Toledo in Islamic Spain. Toledo was one of Al-Andalus's vulnerable city-states, and in 1085, the Christians seized control of it. Unusually, the handover went very smoothly, and as a result, the Muslims already living in Toledo were allowed to remain as citizens and their mosques were left untouched. The city that emerged accommodated both Muslim and Christian. Spain at this time is a paradox. On one hand, tensions between Muslims and Christians are becoming unbearable. And yet, on the other, there is a hugely beneficial intellectual evolution that is only possible because Muslims and Christians are living side by side. When Toledo fell to the Christians, its doors were opened to travellers and intellectuals from all over Europe. These people mixed with the Muslims in the city, learning their language and reading their books. Many of the adventurers came from England. In the late 1100s, an Englishman known as Daniel of Morley travelled to Europe to study. But as his autobiography reveals, he was disgusted with what he found there. I stopped a while in Paris, and there I saw asses rather than men, pretending to be very important. They had desks in front of them, heaving under the weight of two or three immovable tomes, but because they did not know anything, they were no better than marble statues. I did not want to get infected by a similar petrifaction. But when I heard that the doctrine of the Arabs was in fashion in Toledo, I hurried there as quickly as I could so that I could hear the wisest philosophers in the world. Just as the fall of Alexandria had made a massive body of Greek knowledge available to the Arabs 400 years previously, now the Christian conquest of Toledo passed this storehouse of knowledge on to Europeans who flocked here in their hundreds. At the backs of shops and in courtyards, groups of men started to gather together, Christians, Muslims and Jews, to work on texts that had been stored in the archives of mosques and churches. These were extraordinary manuscripts. Translations of Aristotle and Plato and Euclid, as well as original works by Arabic mathematicians, astronomers and alchemists. This was a resource like no other in the rest of Europe. It was intellectual dynamite. 
People came from all over Europe. All these works that were lost in Europe could be found in Toledo. There was lots of wisdom here. How did the translators work together here in Toledo? In the first period, uh, there was uh, usually two people working together. And then another person who was learned in Latin would write it down in Latin. And uh, that was, I think, uh, the target of working together, and it was very clear. I think it really made it more accurate, uh, because it, it was a teamwork. How long have these manuscripts been kept in Toledo? Well, most of the translations were carried out in the 12th and 13th century. That means uh, for almost 900 years, most of them. And here we have the preface in red. That's where we learn about the process of translation. In this case, we read that this book was translated by Ger of Cremona. It is a medical treatise by uh, Ibn Sina, by Avicenna, and it was uh, translated up Arabico from Arabic in Latinum, mm. into Latin, in Toledo. Yeah. It's a very rich document, isn't it? You, you get a sense of how valued these things were. And uh, there is all these little glosses on the right-hand side. Uh, people have been adding comments or explaining words that were not clear. Un momento, por favor. Vamos a Wow, that's a <laughs> splendid beast of a thing. Yeah, yeah. Is this a, it looks like it's a work of Aristotle, is it? Yeah, yeah, this is the Rhetorica by Aristotle. Rhetorica Aristotelis. And here we are, look, his man is working on it. Hermanus Alemanus. Yeah, Hermann the German. Hermann the German. <laughs> yeah, even Germans came all the way to Toledo to find all these texts. And in this case, it is uh, a commentary by Averroes on the text of Aristotle. Ah. And both are translated together. So it's got added value because you've got new Arabic thought coming into the classical text. Yeah, they are adding, they are supplementing, uh, they are uh, completing what was uh, transmitted from the ancient world. Knowledge really is power at, that, at this time in history. It is. Right? Having a book was something very, very valuable. Do you find during this process that words slip from one language to another? Absolutely. Chemia. That word came into Western languages as chemistry. But we have another word, alchemy, that comes originally from Greek through Arabic. They added the article in Arabic, al, and that gave alchemy. English is full of words which came into the language from Arabic in this way. Many of them describe mathematical concepts which were completely new to Europe. Algorithms are named after an Arabic mathematician, and the concept of zero comes from the Arabic sifr, which means empty. It's where we get our word cipher from. But of course, the most obvious and lasting impact is the use of Arabic numerals. And in this Spanish Latin text, which dates from around about 986 AD, we have the first example of Arabic numerals written in Europe. Here they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Imagine trying to do something like multiplication with Roman numerals. Once the numbers get above a certain amount, they are ridiculously unwieldy. This new, agile numerical system made everyday things like bookkeeping and accounting more accessible. Mathematics developed, and the construction of complex architectural projects became much easier. Recently, archaeologists renovating the roof timbers of Salisbury Cathedral in England made a discovery which clarifies this story. On some of the beams that support the roof, there are a series of numbers 
that were carved in around 1200 AD when the cathedral was built. Now, that's a three, and obviously it's familiar to us today, but in its time, it was a curious and progressive symbol. At this time, everyone in England was still using the clunky old Roman numerals, but here in the rafters of one cathedral, a new trend appears to have caught on. These numbers, the numbers that we use today, the fact that they're here is proof that the ordinary craftsmen who carved them benefited from an explosion of knowledge that started in Arabia and spread through Europe via Islamic Spain. And the travellers from Toledo brought more than just practical knowledge back to England. After a number of years, Daniel of Morley returned from Toledo, his cases crammed with documents and volumes. And when he arrived in England, he made an appointment to hand this precious booty over to his patron, who was a bishop. This benefactor was one of a team of scholars who wanted to establish their town as a centre of learning. And the name of the town was Oxford. The universities that were founded in Paris, Bologna and Oxford at this time based their new curriculum on the radical ideas which were pouring out of Toledo. One of Daniel of Morley's compatriots, a man called Adelard of Bath, published this volume just after he got back from Toledo. Um, it's a collection of 76 very basic questions like why is the sea salty, why are there tides, how does the globe hang in the air and uh, do animals have souls? The questions are seemingly simple, but they embody a new spirit of rational inquiry where a blind faith in God is challenged. And Adelard of Bath admits his debt to the Muslims in pursuing this line of inquiry. He writes, from the Arabs, I have learnt one thing, to lead by reason. I will detract nothing from God, but very carefully listen to the limits of human knowledge. Only where this utterly breaks down should we refer things to God. The Muslims developed a massive program of translations in which they translated from Greek into Arabic everything that had reached them. And this was something that was promoted by the whole society. And the result of this is that they translated practically all Greek knowledge. There is a first period in which they translate and they learn, they assimilate. Later, they had learned enough and they began to produce original works by themselves and to criticize Greek science. And, of course, uh, one cannot say that the Arabs were mere transmitters of Greek science. They were the people that continued the work of Greek scientists until they led all this research into a final crisis. And this final crisis was the crisis that brought the Renaissance and the Scientific Revolution. If they had not done this, Renaissance and Scientific Revolution would have been impossible. It would take time for these groundbreaking ideas to become assimilated into Christian Europe. But once they were, Western intellect was transformed. The works of Aristotle were taught in the new universities. The medical treaties of Avicenna were used in hospitals and Arabic translations of Greek geometry and, and those new Arabic numerals were passed on to craftsmen and architects. This was a critical stage in the growth of Western thought. We should no longer see the Renaissance as a rebirth, but the continuation of an intellectual movement which had been nourished centuries earlier by Muslims. The Italian Renaissance is famous for reviving classical learning, but in fact what's happening here 400 years earlier seems to be just as vital. Do you think that Muslim scholars aren't given due credit for what they're doing in Islamic Spain at this time? It is not something that you would learn about in school probably, or even at university. It was probably 
conscious process of neglect. And uh, now uh, we are still suffering from that. Extremely selective history writing. That's right. <laughs> It is due to the conflict that existed between the two worlds. These remarkable ideas were leeching out of Al-Andalus at precisely the same time that the Christians were flooding in. The frontier which had started far north of Madrid was gradually pushing southwards. Then in 1236, Cordoba fell, followed by Valencia and Seville, until by 1250, only the Kingdom of Granada remained Muslim. From now on, Spain would concentrate on cleaning the Muslim presence from its country. The Islamic influence on Europe has been quietly laid down. But when it came to the physical expulsion of the Muslims from Spain, that would be an act that was anything but subtle. It was shocking and absolute. The history of Al-Andalus was about to take a new and sinister turn. In the city of Granada, the Muslims were to fall victim to one of the most shocking acts of ethnic cleansing that Europe has ever seen. Long after the rest of Al-Andalus had fallen to the Christians, Granada remained defiantly Islamic. Protected by mountains and those giant watchtowers and forts, the 70,000 Muslims who lived here managed to hold off attack for another 200 years. But time was running out. While Granada occupied a small territory in the south of Spain, the rest of the country was now divided between Castile in the west and Aragon in the east, two very powerful kingdoms. The King of Castile was about to be forced to pass his kingdom to his niece, Isabella. Isabella was headstrong and passionate, but she also had an acute political mind. In 1469, at the age of 18, she married her second cousin, Ferdinand, the dashing heir to the throne of Aragon. Now, the two most powerful Catholic dynasties in Spain were united, and the reconquest was edging ever closer to completion. Granada was blocking Isabella's vision of a unified Spain, and so it had to be reclaimed. The city was laid to siege for a year before it finally surrendered. On the 1st of January, 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella dressed in elaborate Moorish outfits, which they had especially made. With great pomp and circumstance, they entered the palace of Alhambra and took the keys to the city. As the Muslim ruler Boabdil left in tears, it was said that his mother spat out at him, do not weep like a woman, for that which you cannot defend like a man. Isabella's victory in Granada put an end to an incredible society. In the 700 years that they'd been in Europe, the Muslims of Al-Andalus had built a culture which was the very pinnacle of civilized life, influencing Europe in ways that we're only just beginning to understand. And Isabella would endeavor to ensure that Islam in the West would never enjoy such a relationship again. A few years after Ferdinand and Isabella came to power, they set up an organization that affected the most extreme form of religious control that Europe has ever known. The Inquisition. The purpose of the Inquisition was to track down and eliminate anyone who wasn't an orthodox member of the Catholic Church. Those found guilty of heresy were subjected to a sinister public ceremony called an auto de fe. In this eerie ritual, vestiges of which are still performed today, the guilty were forced to repent their sins while their accusers watched on, hidden under hooded caps. The sinners were then detained, 
Some were burnt at the stake. Most had their homes and livelihoods taken from them. In 1526, the Spanish Inquisition came to Granada to deal with the Muslim problem. Muslims were labeled heretics and given a stark choice, convert to Catholicism, leave the country, or be punished. The Muslims of Granada were segregated from the rest of the population. Their ghetto survives as the old quarter of the city today. It's a fantastic house. Well, well, oh, thank you. Many of the houses that the Muslims were forced out of are still standing. Antonio Orihuela lives in one. It's almost inverted because you don't have any windows looking out onto the street, but the, but the focus is, is in the middle here on the courtyard. Yes, courtyard. the courtyard is the center of the family life. So all the doors and windows are open to the courtyard and close to the, to the street. Privacy was one of the most important characteristics of these houses. Outside the house, they were Christian. They went to the church with the priest. They celebrate the wedding in the Christian way. But then later they came home to celebrate again the wedding in the Muslim style. And um, what happened though when the, when the Inquisition came knocking on the door? Well, as you see, uh, these houses have the bent entry. So from outside, even if the door is open, it's not possible to see what happens in the courtyard. The inquisitors went from door to door, seeking out those they still suspected of being Muslim. A number of civic leaders had already been expelled, and so often it was only women and children left. They herded them up and held them in churches by night so that they could be tried the following morning. Some of the women cried out that they were like lambs being taken to the slaughter and wished that instead they'd been allowed to die in their own home. The Inquisition was so brutally efficient that within 20 years, all Muslims in Spain had been forcibly converted to Catholicism. But this wasn't enough. Many still continued to practice their faith in private. And so, in 1609, the Spanish crown ordered the removal of all Muslims from Spain. Perhaps the most shocking thing in the expulsion is they were not actually expelling Arabs, nor were they expelling Berbers. The huge majority of the people that were being expelled by blood, by DNA, if you will, were as Iberian as their Christian cousins in the north who were kicking them out of the peninsula. It's really quite, it's an enormously different vision of what the expulsions were and what they meant when we realize that the people who were being thrust out were as native to the peninsula as the Christian kings. Why do you think the Catholic authorities felt they had to expel the Moors in 1609? The Spanish Empire, for it was indeed by then the Empire, simply felt pressed by in so many different directions. Uh, they were very much afraid of the Turks, who were in fact raiding from North Africa and raiding along the southern coast of Spain. They were fighting wars still in the Americas. It was one internal problem that they simply could not deal with any longer. In 10 years, over a quarter of a million Muslims were expelled from Spain. Forbidden to take any possessions with them, most sought refuge in North Africa. When Isabella and Ferdinand died, this is where they were buried. It's a little corner of the Alhambra and it's decorated with inscriptions from the Quran. They read, there is no true God but Allah. In many ways, it's a curious choice for a Christian entombment, but it does speak of that complicated relationship that was enjoyed by the Catholics and the Muslims. On one level, it says that Isabella and Ferdinand were still half in love with all things Islamic, but on the other, it's a bold and uncompromising statement of control. And in Cordoba, the new Catholic rulers did something unbelievable. 
In a daring act of what can only be described as inspired vandalism, architects gouged out the center of the mosque. In its place, built one of the most spectacular cathedrals in Spain. The result is a shocking and blasphemous conflation of two of the world's most powerful religions. It is unnervingly beautiful, but possesses an underlying schizophrenia, as if a terrible and silent battle is being carried out in the very architecture of the building. Spain's troubled relationship with its Muslim past continued into the 20th century. The dictator Franco invented his own version of his country's heritage. Well, Franco, this period was somehow interrupting what was for him a continuum history. He wanted somehow to, if not delete it, he wanted to forget about it. So what he did was to explain the whole Muslim or the whole Al-Andalus as a kind of continuum from the Visigothic period to the uh, Catholic kings by saying that the Muslims in Al-Andalus were not such big good Muslims but much more Christianized. So this is the political use of history. He wanted to explain the identity of being a Spaniards. And for Franco that, that identity was a continuation from the Visigothic period right through to the Catholic period. Yeah, exactly. Serafin van Hul is an academic whose books on the history of Al-Andalus are bestsellers in Spain. Do you think that Spanish people today are proud at all of the Arabic episode in their history, or, or are they ashamed of it? No, 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 no not at all. Strictly speaking, it's not our past. It's the past of other people. As a modern-day Spaniard, I would feel very little connection with the Arab past. Spanish people don't live like them. We don't dress like them. We don't feel like them. I don't know how you can say we are the same, because we are not the same. We have nothing in common. Nothing in common. And if I weren't a professor of Arabic studies, I would have absolutely no feeling for Muslim culture. For a very long time, people have protested and urged that history be truthfully told, that they not be fed this nonsense. But this is the inheritance of the Inquisition. The Inquisition's character is alive and well. I can tell you one thing. Spanish people have a tendency to prevent others from speaking their minds, a tendency to try and control the way others behave and think. You can be sure that when you try and speak the truth, you pay for it. And so Al-Andalus fell. East became East and West became West. Two distinct cultures, politically and religiously divided. And yet, what the history of the Moors shows is that these two cultures are also linked in ways that we might never have imagined. The West has been inspired by Islam, but more than that, it was in the very act of fighting the Muslims that Europe consolidated its identity. When we started, Christopher Columbus was setting sail for the New World. And as he pointed his boats westwards, Spain aligned herself with him, turning away from the east. The Muslims had been fought, and now they were to be forgotten. As time went by, memories of the Islamic past were molded until they became a more comforting storybook version of history. But this is a case where truth really is stranger than fiction. The story of Al-Andalus isn't a simple tale of good versus bad, east versus west. It's intriguing and complicated, it's brilliant and brutal. It's very human and it's very messy. 
And it's for precisely that reason that it needs to be remembered, not written out of the history books. Well, if you want to know more about the many cultures that have shaped and changed Britain, visit Origination Insight at channel4.com slash culture. Coming up next on 4, Father Ted is tempted by a saucy novelist. <laughs>